Analyze Asia is brought to you by Esavel. Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams across Asia Pacific? Then you know how painful that can be. Esavel helps your in-house team by taking cumbersome tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across Asia Pacific from onboarding, procuring devices to real-time IT support and offboarding. With our state-of-the-art platform, gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place. Our team of IT support pros are keen to help you grow. Check out esevel.com and get a demo today. Use our referral code ASIA for 10% off. Terms and conditions apply. And so we see the private market as a very interesting space because, as I said, if everybody had 20% of their portfolio in private markets, we're moving from almost zero in a mass affluent hand to 20%. That's a lot of wealth. But that wealth requires a lot of thinking, a lot of platforms, a lot of technology innovation to solve because private markets is very complex. If you think about simple things like cryptocurrencies or stocks, the way that it trades the post asset servicing is quite simple. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung, and with capital in the form of interest rates becoming more expensive, switching from the era of growth at all costs into growth with maximum profitability. What does it mean for the private companies and accredited investors out there? With me today, Chu Oyi, CEO of edX to help us to decipher how the investors are thinking about the private markets. Oyi, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, really great to be with you today. Yeah, and I thought we should just mention that we met during the F1 event this year with you giving a discussion on private markets to a couple of the C-suite executives. And I thought it was a pretty interesting time. And I think we want to discuss about the private markets as such, but as of all times, I usually have my first time guests on the show. I want to dive into their origin stories. How do you start your career? Thanks, Bernard. Um, I started my life as an investment banker. So I spent very much the last sort of two decades in Singapore, running most recently running UBS Investment Bank. And the last 20 years in Singapore has been very interesting from a capital markets point of view. And I think it reflects a bit the global revolution or evolution of fund management. And we looked at a lot of REITs because that became a very big asset class that added to investors' wealth. And of course, in the last few years, there have been a lot of changes in the market. You know, there's an argument of passive versus aggressive versus active mandates. There's obviously a big debate about consolidation of asset managers. We start, also started to see the rise of the private markets. And as an investment banker, you generally tended to focus your time on the public capital markets. But for me, that visibility around private markets started to be a bit more obvious at, at UBS. And therefore, the fascination when ADEX came to me and talked to me about a chief commercial officer role, uh, I explored the possibilities of that and said, you know, this is really quite quite rare. It's not been done before. And in that exploration, obviously, I, Addicts got me very excited and I joined Addicts uh, th almost three years ago now as CEO and now I'm a CEO of the company. Mm. And I think moving from a career in investment banking to Addicts, I would say it's a, more of a scale up rather than a startup from there. How, how does the experience actually translate? Wow. I mean, it's been an insane experience because an investment bank in a, in a large international bank is very different. I mean, you have a lot of support. You have a generally a big team. You have very specialized teams. And when you want to see a client, you know, this big presentation drops on your table. And if you want marketing resources right around the corner, you know, you have a lot of infrastructure. In a startup, it's been completely different. So it's the application of a very different skill set using your traditional competence. Because we're still talking about finance, but finance with a new lens, private markets, capital markets with a new lens. So it's not, I would say it's not for everyone. I would say that I really enjoy the process of creating teams, the ideas, taking this to market and having a lot more direct impact with our decision making and, and what we do, which is, as you know, has been increasingly difficult in a traditional banking format. Mm. So I, I guess 
you have a pretty illustrious career as an investment banker. Now went from a CCO all the way to a CEO position in a scale up. Can you talk about what are the interesting career lessons you can share with my audience? That's a very good question. I feel that there is probably a group of what we call traditional finance professionals who feel increasingly burdened either by a system set up that's in its design about three or four decades old. So they're struggling with old archaic systems. We're also struggling at the traditional finance level, the regulatory burden. The bank has to catch up with the amount of regulations that are coming in place. So I think one is the energy level around problem solving. Two is I think fintechs presents a very interesting opportunity for traditional finance professionals because fintech is very complex. It's, it's not easy for someone with lesser experience to sort of try and recreate the wheel, right? As you know, finance is intertwined within a bigger ecosystem. It's, it's not so easy to create new product or disrupt. So you do need a, a very experienced finance person to cross from a traditional bank into fintech. But I think more importantly, it's also, I actually feel relatively financially secure. As I mentioned, I've been in the space for 20, 30 years. Feel comfortable at a professional level to make that leap, but also financially been comfortable to make that leap because obviously joining a startup has many and you do you do not know if you can make that shift or not make that shift. So I would say from a career, but on the flip side of that, from a career perspective, if you are looking for impact, you are looking for an autonomy or, or creativity and a space that you feel that you can take years of experience and create something new, then definitely broadly, FinTech is a very exciting space to be in right now. Mm. And, and it comes to uh, the main subject of the day, uh, which I want to talk about edX and the private markets in the Asia Pacific. I, I, I think one interesting thing, I was actually reading Matt Levine's article on the only crypto story that you need, I think published in Bloomberg. And he made this really good point, right? About finance at its heart is about moving future wealth into the present by borrowing or moving present wealth into the future by saving. So I want to start off by asking you, can you talk about the state of private markets in the Asia Pacific region and what is the untapped market opportunity to access these markets for investors? Yeah, I think what's quite exciting in, in the last decade, but I think it's been more prominent in the last two years or three years, is that the traditional advice used to be very simplistically 60-40 stocks bought. And then you reallocate or you, you know, you, every year and then you, you sort of do that. By that method, you could get some portfolio diversification. They, it shouldn't be sort of too far off. But increasingly over the last sort of few years, the new advice is actually 80 public, 20 alternatives. What do I mean by alternatives? Private equity, hedge funds, real estate, present structured credit, they all present different investment opportunities. Now, why is that more prominent today? Actually, over the last 10 years, sovereign wealth funds, institutional capital, pension funds, have all started to allocate anywhere between 20 to 30% of their global portfolio into alternatives, right? Because they want to uh, have a front row seat on growth or innovation. So therefore, they deploy into PE and VC. And what's happening is more capital went into the private markets. Companies were staying private and becoming unicorns in a private setting before then they IPO'd. And this is starting to move towards global family offices, ultra high net worth individuals. And it kind of got stuck at that level because there's no technological capability to solve for the masses. And so we see the private market as a very interesting space because as I said, if everybody had 20% of their portfolio in private markets, we're moving from almost zero in a mass affluent hand to 20%. That's a lot of wealth. But that wealth requires a lot of thinking, a lot of platforms, a lot of technology innovation to solve because private markets is very complex. If you think about simple things like cryptocurrencies or stocks, the way that it trades the post-asset servicing is quite simple. Private markets by itself, it's actually many structures, many tenors, 
many different structures of management fees, open-ended, closed-ended distributions, redemptions. It does take a lot of technological innovation to be able to service at scale and to service for the individual at scale. And we see this trend accelerate during COVID, partly because the word digitization was appearing quite often. We see blockchain forming actually the base load of that, that workhorse that needs to support private markets into mass affluent. And so I, I think that, and plus in today's environment where the public markets has been so volatile, in fact, I suspect Bitcoin is less volatile than the tech stocks in the US, <laughs> that you're starting to see investors saying, wait, hang on a minute. I want capital preservation. I want wealth preservation. And there's so much margin calls that are happening in public markets. Where do I deploy that in private markets? So we're at an interesting confluence uh, in Asia, I think. Mm. And I want to caveat that whatever we discuss is actually information. It is not meant to be any investment advice, okay? So for all those who want to do their own investment, please do your own private research. So I, I, I want to get back to the question on Based on the market opportunity that you talk about, what are the inspiration and the problem that edX is poised to solve for the private markets itself? Hmm. The private bankers, investment bankers, they're all sort of saying to generally, right, people who have the capability that, hey, you know, as I said, you should allocate 20% to alternatives. So the wealthy, the large sort of capital sources have a broader wealth toolkit to enhance their portfolio. And I personally think it is hypocritical to not be able to bring that down to the mass affluent and to retail at some point. And if if you say that out loud to, let's say, you know, any private bank or any compliance or risk officer, the biggest thing that they react to is, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is risky product. This is not suitable for the mass affluent. And I present a different argument, which actually forms the base of why edX is this. My argument is suitability and risk profile is partly driven by size and partly driven by liquidity. If you look at the minimum ticket size to invest in, let's say, a hedge fund, it's generally 1 million. So it doesn't make sense for a 5 million net worth guy to put a single ticket of a million dollars in a hedge fund, right? If, of course, it's risky, of course, it's unsuitable. The other thing about this $1 million is it's likely to be locked up. So you can't redeem, you can't sell, you're stuck there. So you need to sit in there, let's say, for five years. And what happens in the middle of that five years if you need to buy a new house, you get a divorce, your kids need to go to college, it's, it's very difficult to monetize. For PE funds, even worse, that's 10 years. So our hypothesis is two things. The individual needs sizing. So fractionalization becomes a feature of our platform. And the second is individuals need liquidity. It doesn't mean that you have to be publicly traded and high frequency, what all of that. It means that when an individual needs to sell or novate a, a position in a P fund, that he or she is able to find a marketplace to do it and do it efficiently. With these two components, you don't, like I said, you don't need blockchain to do it, but you need a platform to do it at scale. Fractionalization and liquidity can be done by a lot of methodologies, but it needs to be done at scale. And today, the, the, the technology that best serves it, that we can think of, what we see or we build, is actually what we do. Mm. So you're now the CEO of edX. What is the mission and vision of the company now? So our we are very focused on democratizing access to private markets. That's what we're focused on. We feel that if we can build an efficient platform and technology to service mass affluent, and, and you know, in our definition at the moment is accredited investors in the Singapore nomenclature, if we service this well, and if we do this well, and we create avenues for liquidity and, and sizing for the mass affluent, we think that this, our end goal is to provide it for retail. Because if you can provide it for mass affluent, you can provide it for retail. The, the big gap is going to be where regulators get comfortable. But our true, I mean, our vision is to democratize that. And, and we think that we think there's so many opportunities and so many good investment opportunities that exist today, which a lot of investors don't have access to, or if they have access to, not in the size that they can make sense of. So for example, we've got hedge funds, private credit funds, 
we're no longer saying 250,000 or a million. We're actually saying 20,000, 10,000, 5,000. Size it down to your portfolio, build your own portfolio to suit your own personal financial needs. So that, and if we can take that down to one level, which I think would be our dream scenario. Mm. Well, I think you alluded to the fact that someone with a relatively, say, a 5 million net worth able to deploy funds, I think that also falls under the definition of what an accredited investor would look like. Can you talk about maybe what are the other customer profiles that fit into this category in order to access ADEX? Not necessarily the investor side, but also maybe the, the entrepreneurs who are seeking financing for their private companies, etc. Et yeah, so so on the investor side, accredited investor in the Singapore definition is a technical one, right? It's 300,000 net income, 1 million net financial assets, 2 million net worth. Let's say you're an entry-level accredited investor. If, if you're allocating 20% to alternatives, you're talking about, let's say, 400,000. And you want to do that across eight to 10 ideas, right? You're not going to put that into one. So we serve, I think the, the sweet spot for us is the 2 to 20 million investor. Now that, that's on the investor side. We also see actually smaller corporates, smaller family offices that don't necessarily have the full access. They are also sort of reaching out to us for a product set for their own treasuries or their own investments. Now on the supply side, we do a lot of funds today because Obviously, that is a great proposition. If you don't know how to approach private markets, maybe think about it from a manager point of view, who is a good fund manager, who has got track record, who's got a global reputation. That's our starting point. But I do see over time, what we've created in stage two was we created a platform for SMEs to raise commercial paper. So we have two or three corporates, who, or three corporates actually, an increasing number who don't want to do big size bonds and long tenor bonds. They want to do three months, six month type facilities. By the way, that's actually been quite popular because of the rate environments rising. And so therefore, investors like these shorter term paper. But that also means that we create a space for SMEs and startups to raise capital. And because we are technology-based platform, the speed and the cost to fundraising is faster. It's simpler. Of course, they, they, we always have to strategize and find the home for that supply. So our investor selection targeting needs to be sought through. But in the end of the day, a lot of the upfront and the painful work, how quickly you take it to market, then you've got to think about a settlement where the money is going to come from. Do I trust this guy? He's going to pay me the money. All that is solved by our technology. So then the hard part is looking for the right investor and pitching and making sure that the story is well developed. So what are the products and services that edX actually provides for the customer? Specifically, I think when we think about private companies, I think you mentioned the fact that they seek funding and then there is like family offices who are interested into investing in market may look at the size of the position itself. How does that work? We have one interesting case study, which is called XM Studios. It's a, a company here in Singapore that over the last sort of 10 years, have built a very strong global business in luxury figurines. So they get licenses from Marvel and, and all of that. So they wanted to raise some capital ahead of potentially a capital markets exit or, or listing. And so they worked with us to raise money from accredited investors. And a listing process is very complex in, let's say, the SGX format, right? You are a bunch of lawyers, there's, there's a lot of paperwork, and that's because it's going to retail. But coming to, onto our platform is a bit simpler because we're working with sophisticated investors. So we have a shorter path and a shorter listing process. And, you know, to, to get the funding distributed, listed, traded on our platform. And eventually, I mean, my my desire is also obviously to see some of these companies go to SGX and do their IPO because then we become the springboard or the platform for many of these startups to, and I want to support Singapore Exchange, of course, for national reasons and for and because they're my shareholder as well, for them to then make a very efficient leap from a private to a public company. So how is edX actually looking at the management of digital assets, specifically cryptocurrencies and its related products. I, I think this is a pretty interesting area because now, as you mentioned, the Bitcoin price didn't really move this month and suddenly went up in the midst of today, but probably will change in the next week when this is published, of course. Yeah, 
we use distributed ledger, right? We're a blockchain-based technology. We think of life in tokens and fiat and securities token. We don't actually have a full-fledged crypto capability, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But when we built this, blockchain obviously became the core of the conversation because we do think that blockchain will create a lot of efficiency in the capital markets and banking and all of those. Over time, actually, more acutely in the last sort of few weeks, I think we've seen MAS been very vocal about the digital asset ecosystem and how they themselves, and we reflect some of that view, actually we're one of the first to come out of the sandbox uh, with this. The world will start to sort of think about tokenization as a mainstream technology, not, not really a side gig. And where we're going to see is how do we think about settlements, digital currency, CBDCs, stable coins? How does edX think about making sure that we future-proof the platform? For example, can USDC be a main currency for settling into funds that are USD-based on our platform? So we're already very advanced in the thinking. We have some simple build-out. We have, we're building out a crypto custody for just a few coins for now to make sure that we build the building blocks. So a custody is one piece. At some point, buying funds in uh, with stable coins or, or maybe even Bitcoin Ethereum at some point. Because also over time, we're not aware of the view that cryptocurrencies will stay as part of the allocation into private markets. It does become an asset class. That's our that's our view. And so it will sit alongside all the other alternative assets. So we need to build that capability to support that from an addict's point of view. And we think that we're, we're very well positioned for that. Can you share some of the highlights that addicts have achieved in the past few years and also talk about the key partnerships that you have also acquired in the process? Yeah, you know, we were born into the COVID years. So it was very interesting. It, it forced everyone to approach business differently. Webinars and all that became the norm. We struggled with not having physical events because we were also trying to position ourselves as a new and, and digital platform. And of course, adoption, we were wondering if you know any of the funds or any of the companies would work with us because it was such a new concept. It was, okay, how do we survive through COVID? What was very good was we did one deal, we did a second deal, and then we started getting a track record. And then we knew we were confident of our capability across the different product set. When we started building different features for, for example, a coupon payment or redemption, open-ended funds, we then enhanced our platform capability. What we started to see on the supply side were fund managers were very keen to work with digital platforms because they saw that as the platform to the future of investing. And in 2021, when obviously the markets were far, far more appreciative, well, a bit more growth driven, a bit more investing driven, we saw a lot of global names think about digitization and retailization of their product. So some of our key partners, for example, Partners Group, Hamilton Lane, KKR, InvestCorp, some of the global managers that took that leap with us because they saw that. And with those, we're starting obviously to build a platform across with different managers and, and all of that. We're very happy with that progress. Obviously, 2022 has been an extremely difficult year for investors, for GPs, for everyone investing, in, in, in my opinion. But if I reflect across the, the ideas that we put on our platform, actually, I, I jokingly say, if you bought everything that edX listed, up or down relative to the public markets today, let's say the S&P index, I think we would still net net present a stronger portfolio if you if you have that diversification. And I think the one interesting question I wanted to ask you is in terms of dealing with regulators. In anything to do with asset management, typically the regulators come into play. How, how does edX actually work with regulators such as MAS, I think, or probably OJK in the other parts of in Indonesia to ensure compliance with the private companies seeking funding from accredited investors? So today we are regulated by MAS. We... So we focus on the securities and futures regulation around what MAS has developed. And of course, the KYC AML is of the framework that MAS has. And because we're one of the earliest that came out with that capital market sort of infrastructure, we 
we work very closely with MAS and and I think they see that that relationship, the digital assets of ecosystem likewise. And we love to use MAS as really, or, or, or we talk about MAS a lot because my view is MAS has been very thoughtful about the blockchain, cryptocurrency, and how they define each of them and how they approach digital securities, for example, differently from cryptocurrencies. And they may or may not approach, depending on where we end up with stable coins, how they think about stable coins. So that's not consistently replicated globally. So there is still some unevenness in the way regulators think about cryptocurrencies and digital securities and stable coins and other tokenized products. And some of them reach out to us partly because we have been really the private sector face of that. And we share our views as to how this should be looked at. From our perspective, because we regulated first and then technology supports that regulated securities, I think there's also a lot of trust with how MAS has approached it. And if you see our shareholders, our shareholder base are like UOB, SGX, Stock Exchange of Thailand, Kung Street, Patra, very, very uh, financial institution backing. There's a very high level of comfort in talking to regulators. My view is the world will eventually start to split in different ways, split cryptocurrencies, digital securities or tokenized securities and stable coins because we will have to think about where CBDCs are, wholesale or retail. We'll have to think about stable coins and where that plays relative to CBDCs and then how the infrastructure will then settle for capital markets. DVP, does DVP instantaneous settlement really become a norm as opposed to a surprise? Yeah, that, that comes to a, a very interesting point as well, right? I think we are currently in a down market. What should founders and employees think about the opportunity of secondary liquidity events, which actually take pressure off them, but also at the same time to get the funding in building the company? I mean, given so much volatility going on in the markets with rising interest rates. I think everyone is very fearful today. I think uh, companies uh, feel the pressure of employees who have been taking a lot of shares and not a lot of cash. The question is whether the markets are going to be ready anytime soon. I think the optimistic, any optimistic view is second half next year. And even if it is optimistic in second half next year, it doesn't necessarily mean that the market, the IPO market is completely open yet. And I think Asia has taken that capital markets for granted in the last decade or so. Well, I mean, give and take. So there will be pressure building up from the employee point of view to find some liquidity. There will be some pressure always on, on VCs and PEs who've been in these companies for enough time and they're coming near the end of their fun life, there's going to be some pressure around that. We would love to start building that ecosystem. We've done a few. We don't. We think we want to build a bigger ecosystem. We think that probably some mechanics that need to be built before companies are completely comfortable to do that. Because if you're a pre-IPO company, the last thing you need is something that's live and trading. But you may want to think about pockets of organized liquidity for your employees. That to me is very convenient because then I get employee shares that we can do the due diligence on who owns the shares, where it sits on the capital stack, provenance and ownership is going to be something that's very key for any investor to think about as they invest in these private companies. For the private markets in general, what, what is the mental model that investors need to have in valuing the companies that they invest into? I mean, is it art? for companies before Series B and science after Series B rounds? Wow. <laughs> that is such an interesting question. You are probably right. A bit of art, I think to some extent for an, an average accredited investor, it's very difficult. Where we think will provide some landing is the lead investor. Who is the lead investor? How much of that is the lead investor? And how is the lead investor driving the valuation, the synergies, and, and all of that. That becomes the convenient flagpole for, for the average AI to, to look at. 
But you are right. I think after Series B, presumably there should be enough comps. There should be enough data to go behind that. But it is still, I think, not not easy to do that. But it would be great because, as I say, one of the things that we'd love to do is to create an understanding of private markets and private company and gross valuation. Where Singapore has been, I feel, lacking is because we don't have enough growth-style companies listing on SGX, the average Singapore investor is very focused on price-earnings ratio. Totally agree. Right? I mean, you say, hey, would you invest in Grab, the DSPAC and all that? And people say, well, what's the PE ratio? And it's a bit like PE ratio. No, that, that's not how you should look at growth companies. And even if we create an education layer so that we understand how growth companies could be listed on SGX, I think that would be great for our investor base here. And it's also very dividend-driven as well, if, if, I, if I think about it. Um, it, it hardly sets up companies, even existing listed companies. Maybe DBS is the exception where they trade it like a, almost like a tech company, but the rest, they are just expecting them to pay out dividends, which is totally not, doesn't make sense in a market, in today's market. I mean, Amazon has never given a dividend, but if you look at the stock itself, it's sky high. I say that with all respect for my ex-employer who I used to work for. I think that technology disruption is so fascinating. We must create space for it. We must create capital for it. We must create home for it. And if you see the market cap of the US or the market cap of the, let's say the top 10 companies in the US and in China and Hong Kong, those that were top 10 market cap 10 years ago are now knocked off. And now the top 10 are tech companies and not banks and all in gas. And this has fueled a lot of the discussion around disruption and innovation and what that does for the average person. And I'd love to see Singapore in that space. Yeah. I want to go back to the conversation on cryptocurrencies and digital asset spaces, a space that I heavily work as a both a crypto trader and an angel investor. I think the way I always like to think about it is whether a token or a stock is basically a bond or a call option. So depending on where you behave, like a stock can be, you know, Amazon is a bond and then Tesla is a call option. For a token, you know, I could think of Bitcoin and Ethereum as a bond and then Solana as a call option. I want to circle into the conversation on how do you look at the digital asset space, specifically cryptocurrencies and NFTs and the role of decentralized finance. I mean, you think about the RV is the Uniswap compound from the perspective of edX. One, one interesting thing is that it doesn't matter what you do in Web3 or cryptocurrencies. You're already public from day one when you're listed on the exchange. It's almost like you're building an embedded capital market right at the start of it. I mean, if you think about it, crypto traders can be the equivalent of activist shareholders that can move and up and down your tokens without it. How, how do you think about that? The volatility is actually the embedded capital market that sits in these Web3 companies when they start to launch a token into this space. Yeah, I, I don't begin to even half analyze that. If I can just solve my regulated securities, I think I would be very proud of myself. <laughs> But I do see the convergence. I do see a lot of the TradFi or, or there is a huge attempt at, at, from the TradFi view to understand DeFi, to understand tokenomics, to understand how does the RBAs of this world do it better? How do the Uniswaps of this world do it better? Are they worried that DeFi will disrupt or take over or completely dis uh, destroy the need for banks? I think the answer is probably not. I don't think the government are going to say, hey, DeFi, please take over all the inefficiencies and in the financial services because financial services play a centralized role. That's why they exist for the, the governments and the regulators to have someone accountable for any bad behavior. And what we're seeing today, which is exactly what's happening, two years ago, if you said regulate crypto, people would be you know, yelling and screaming on the street. Today, the same people are probably yelling and screaming for regulation. More, not less. So this is a very interesting dynamic. But if you see MAS, MAS is also encouraging traditional banks under Project Guardian to see how they can apply DeFi concepts or DeFi itself into TradFi. Now, I mean, this is a very long shot and it probably is just some experimentation on tokenized bonds or structured products. 
but it will force everyone to move to converge. There will be a convergence. I don't know how the convergence will end up looking like, but I, I do know that regulators will want to make this happen because they want to know how to regulate it or how to shift regulation to respond to DeFi or DeFi protocols if it were to be really standardized by C5 or Track 5. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of, I guess, compliance issues as, as of where you originated from, from the investment banks, right? The, the compliance is going to stop the the trading side to go into DeFi because the question now is, how are you going to deal with liabilities? How do you insure yourself against that? I think that there will be a middle ground from the enterprise finance to get into the decentralized finance because the use definitely makes sense and it managed to stay forth against the crypto contagion that went off. I, I think, you know, all the all the three arrow Celsius, they were all C5, they were all collapsed, but the DeFi protocols just hang on yeah. really tight there. Yes. On, on, on there. So given the current macroeconomic climate and a lot where I think private companies will take a longer time to achieve exits, do you think that there are any pockets of opportunities where they can actually engineer a secondary ex- exit? Like for example, we have we've seen SPACs or even other instruments now uh, moving ahead. Yes, absolutely. The question is not whether there are platforms or for example, I mean, I say things like we can tokenize anything, right? It's not so much whether the platforms are available. It's actually whether there is demand. And in this market, I think that is a challenge. So it is more around, let's wait for the right time so that we get a more stable uh, investor Mm. base who's not worried about different things in the market. I mean, today growth, as you said, right? Growth at all costs, that's, that's not possible. And even growth without profitability, I think it needs to be specific projects that are being funded. Not everything is being funded today, but the market will come back. I mean, we have to be somewhat optimistic. The question is, how do we prepare for it? How do we get ready for it? Or maybe it's some intermediate capital. Maybe it is, for example, we have a venture debt fund on our platform. Maybe it is looking for different avenues to sustain or bridge until we see clarity in the markets next year. And it could be platforms like us. It could be different capital providers. There are some options. I think it's just about looking for it. And then with the recent rate hikes now to curb rising inflation, so the market has triggered an economic downturn. I'm pretty sure we're going into a recession. So most VCs are deliberately now turning off their taps and letting the startups either rise or go underwater, given they have their upper hand on valuation now. I I think maybe just as a person who sits in between these two groups of stakeholders, what would be your advice to entrepreneurs and even capital allocators out there thinking about this? For companies, if you have not felt the capital completely disappearing, you you it would be quite odd. Every single startup, every single young company can almost see the capital flow retract. So you have to respond to that. And it's not coming back anytime soon. I think the idea of Inflation is not going to go away anytime soon. The Feds are going to continue to increase interest rates. That's not going anywhere anytime soon. The IPO markets have no visibility until if you're vaguely optimistic mid next year. So I think the best advice is to hunker down, to manage costs, to stay very focused because this is not the time to do things that are out there. I think you just need to sort of make sure you have enough resources and spend the right amount of resource to position yourself eventually. For capital allocators, I think there's still some particular projects that if you take a longer term view will come out of this well. So that presumably are projects, I mean, we see blockchain projects, I mean, somewhat like ourselves with a very interesting real use cases that are still continuing to be funded. And that generally is a clearer articulation of what the business case might be. I think those that are just blockchain projects for the sake of blockchain projects, those will struggle. But those that can, founders who can describe a vision and a proper business model, I think those will continue to get some amount of support right now. So what does great look like for edX in the next few years then? Well... I would love to see edX in different countries. I would love to see our investor base expand, either regionally or or globally. Of course, that takes some work from a regulatory point of view. 
I would love to see a bigger demonstration of democratization and that either could be at a direct to consumer level or partnerships with securities houses and banks and to solve their problems. So that's one of the, the biggest pain points. The second biggest pain point that we see is traditional financial institutions are actually increasingly looking at DLT themselves or building their own blockchains and and approaching the world from that lens. So I actually see us as a bigger part, or if I imagine the world as decentralized, decentralization of traditional finance. So everyone mm. sort of has nodes and everyone's connected to each other. I would love to see ADEX be the core of that or the heart of that. We're a big part of that ecosystem. We help people solve problems. We think about tokenization as actually being the greater part of capital markets tomorrow, I think that will be where I see edX will be great. Mm. And that would be like a core financial infrastructure for everyone to use or the shovels behind everyone. Is that how I understand it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Oye, many thanks for coming on the show. But in closing, I always have two questions to ask. The first one, any recommendations that have inspired you recently? Inspirations. Hmm. Wow. Could be a book, movie, you know. Movie, well, I won't TV say show. inspire, but I don't have that much time for movies. But I was compelled to watch Top Gun 2, <laughs> which shows my age. And that was so interesting how Tom Cruise can stay relevant. The first movie was 30 years ago, and now he still looks you know, as young as he did. Mm. Uh, so that, that was quite interesting. Book-wise, you know, I read this book about habits. I can't remember the title. I'll share with you right after. And it really helped me rethink my daily habits and how do I be a better person, a more efficient person through habit building. So that was quietly inspiring as well. Mm. And how do my audience find you? You can reach out to www.addx.co. I'm sure mm. one of my friendly colleagues will reach out. I'm on LinkedIn, so connect with me there. I'm on a number of speaking engagements as well. I'll hang out on, at the Singapore FinTech Festival probably on the last day. Oh. So if you want to come and look for our booth, we're right in hall, one of the halls. Definitely, you can find us on any podcast platform and of course, tweet to us and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and to help us to get this covered. And of course, share us your feedback. And I am about one episode away from our 400 and we'll look forward to chatting in the next episode. So, Oi, many thanks for coming on the show and I look forward to speak to you in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard.